All right, welcome everyone. We're going to be starting off with chapter nine, which will be the final chapter regarding equilibrium processes for this course. And specifically, we're going to be discussing chemical equilibrium electrochemistry. So, such apparently unrelated processes as combustion, respiration, photosynthesis, and corrosion are actually all closely related, for in each of them, an electron, sometimes accompanied by a group of atoms, is transferred from one species to another. Together with the proton transfer typical of acid-base reactions, processes in which electrons are transferred, the so-called redox reactions, account for many of the reactions encountered in chemistry. Redox reactions, the principal topic of this chapter, are immensely practical are of immense practical significance, not only because they underlie many biochemical and industrial processes, but also because they're the basis of the generation of electricity by chemical reactions and the investigation of reactions by making electrical measurements. Measurements like the ones we describe in this chapter lead to a collection of data that are very useful for discussing the characteristics of electrolyte solutions and a wide range of different types of equilibria in solutions. They're also used throughout inorganic chemistry to assess the thermodynamic feasibility of reactions and the stabilities of compounds. They're used in physiology to discuss the details of the propagation of signals and neurons. Before getting down to business, a word about notation um, that's unique to this text. Throughout the chapter and book, we use natural log of x for the natural logarithm of x to the base e. Sometimes this logarithm is written log sub score e to the x. We use log the x for the common logarithm x base 10. Um, and I think this is something that is relatively conventional for most folks. But if there's any ambiguity, remember that this is a two log, uh, natural log involves log on a 2.303 basis versus a 10 basis. So, starting out with ions in solution, the most significant difference between the solution of an electrolyte and of a non-electrolyte is that there are long-range columbic interactions between the ions in the former. As a result, electrolyte solutions exhibit non-ideal behavior even at very low concentrations because of the solute particles, the ions, do not move independently of one another. Some idea of the importance of ion-ion interactions is obtained by noting the average separation in solution of different molar concentrations, C, and to appreciate the scale, the typical number of water molecules that can fit between them. So here we see the term C molar concentration in moles per cubic decimeter. And we can see the degree of separation as well as the number of water molecules between. And at very, very low concentrations, such as 0 0.001 moles per cubic decimeter, you'll have a separation of about 90 nanometers with as many as 30 water molecules between them. But as you get close to one mole per cubic decimeter, you may only have three water molecules between ions. So we see how to take the interaction between ions into account, which become very important for the concentrations of 0.01 mole per cubic decimeter and more in the first part of this chapter. A second difference is that an ion in solution responds to the presence of an electric field, migrates through the solution, and carries charge from one location to another. Our bodies are electric conductors, and some of the thoughts you are currently having as you read or listen to the sentence, can be traced to the migration of ions through membranes in the enormously complex electrical circuits of your brain. So, a brief comment. The Coulomb interactions between two charges, Q1 and Q2, separated by distance R, is described by the columbic potential energy listed here, where epsilon equals 8.854 times 10 to the negative 12 per joule coulomb squared per meter. Um, and what we're really looking at here is that you can see that the magnitude of the two charges matter, but that the potential energy associated with that attraction varies based on the 
inverse of the radius. So, moving right along. We've seen that the thermodynamic properties of solutes are expressed in terms of their activities, A sub J, in which a kind of dimensionless effective concentration and that activities are related to concentrations by multiplication by an activity coefficient. There are various ways of expressing concentration. In the first part of this chapter, we use molality, B sub J, and can write that the activity of J equals the activity coefficient, where times B sub J over B, where B equals one mole per kilogram. For notational simplicity, we'll replace B sub J over B by B sub J itself, treat B as the numeric value of the molality, and write the following equation 9.1b. Because the solution becomes more ideal as the molality approaches zero, we know that the activity coefficient approaches one as the concentration or molality approaches zero. Once we know the activity of the species J, we can write its chemical potential by using relationship 9.2 here. The thermodynamic properties of the solution, such as the equilibrium constants of reactions involving ions, can be derived in the same way as for ideal solutions, but with activities in place of concentrations. However, when we want to relate the results we derive to observations, we need to know how to relate activities to concentrations. We ignored that problem when discussing acids and bases and simply assumed that all activity coefficients were one. In this chapter, we see how to improve that approximation. One problem that confronts us from the outset is that cations and anions always occur together in solution. Therefore, there's no experimental procedure for distinguishing the deviations from ideal behavior due to the cations from those from the anions. We cannot measure the activity coefficients of cations and anions separately. The best we can do experimentally is to ascribe deviations from ideal behavior equally to each kind of ion and to talk in terms of a mean activity coefficient. For salt, Mx, such as sodium chloride, we can show in derivation 9.1, which is in the text, that the mean activity coefficient is related to the activity coefficients of the individual ions as follows in relationship 9.3a. So for some salt, M sub P, X sub Q, such as magnesium phosphate, where P equals 3 and Q equals 2, the mean activity coefficients related to the activity coefficients of the individual ions as follows. Noting that we've included the P and Q as exponents in this relationship and that 1 over s, the exponent governing the entire structure, is the sum of p and q. Thus, for magnesium phosphate, where we have 3 magnesium and 2 phosphates, s would equal 5, and the mean activity coefficient for each type of ion would look like this. Suppose we found a way to calculate the actual activity coefficients of sodium and sulfate ions in 0.010 molal sodium sulfate and found them to be 0.98 and 0.84 respectively. And these are contrived values, just so you know. The mean activity coefficient would be equal to 0.98 squared times 0.84 and then that entire quantity would have a cube root. So the overall value would be 0.93. This is because P equals 2, Q equals 1, and S equals 3. The question still remains, however, about how the mean activity coefficients can be estimated. 
A theory that accounts for their values in very dilute solutions was developed by Peter Debye and Eric Huckel in 1923. They supposed that each ion in solution is surrounded by an ionic atmosphere of countercharge. The atmosphere is actually the slight imbalance of charge arising from the competition between thermal motion, which tends to keep all the ions distributed uniformly through the solution, and the columbic interaction between ions, which tends to attract counter ions into each other's vicinity and repel ions of like charge, which is shown in figure 9.1. As a result of this competition, there's a slight excess of cations near any anion, giving a positive charged ionic atmosphere around that anion, and a slight excess of anions near any cation, giving a negatively charged ionic atmosphere around the cation. Because each ion in an atmosphere of opposite charge, its energy is lower than in a uniform ideal solution, and therefore its chemical potential is lower than in an ideal solution. A lowering of the chemical potential of an ion below its ideal solution value is equivalent to the activity coefficient of the ion being less than 1. Debbie and Huckel were able to derive an expression that a limiting law, that is a limiting law in the sense that it becomes increasingly valid as the concentration of ion approaches zero. So the debbie huckel limiting law is the following, relationship 9.4. Note that the common logarithm is used in this particular case not the natural log. In this expression, A is a constant that for water at 25 degrees Celsius works out to 0 0.509. Z sub J are the charge numbers of the ions. So Z plus would be plus one for sodium and Z minus would be negative two for sulfate. The vertical bars mean that we ignore the sign of the product. The quantity I is the ionic strength of solution, which is identified in terms of the molalities of the ions as follows in relationship 9.5a. We use equation 9.5, or excuse me, when using equation 9.5, make sure to include all the ions present in solution, not just those of interest. For instance, if you're calculating the ionic strength of a solution of silver chloride and potassium nitrate, there are contributions to the ionic strength from all four types of ions. When more than two ions contribute to the ionic strength, we write the following, where the symbol, uh, which looks like a sideways E, is a sum. In the case of all terms, the sum of all terms uh, for the form Z sub I squared B sub I. Z sub I is the charge number of an ion, I, positive for uh, cations and negatives for anions, and B sub I is the molality. As we've stressed, equation 9.4 is a limiting law and is reliable only in very dilute solutions. For solutions with more concentrated values than 10 to the negative third moles per cubic decimeter, ion-ion interactions become even more important. And it's better to use an empirical modification known as the extended Debye-Huckel law which is in relationship 9.6. Here, where B and C are dimensionless constants, this is shown in figure 9.2. Although B can be interpreted as a measure of the closest approach of an ion, it, like C, is best regarded as an adjustable empirical parameter. So taking a look at figure 9.2, the variation of the activity coefficient with ionic strength according to the extended Debye-Huckel theory is that A, shown that is that A, the limiting law for a 1 1 electrolyte, B, the extended law, where B equals 0.5, and C, the extended law extended further by the addition of the term, in this case, with C equaling 0.2. The last form of the law reproduces the observed behavior reasonably well. So, let's start talking about migration of ions. Ions are mobile in solution, and the study of their motion down a potential gradient gives an indication of their size, the effect of solvation, and details of the type of motion they undergo.
The migration of ions in solution is studied by measuring the electrical resistance of a solution of known concentration in a cell like that shown in figure 9.3, just to the right. The resistance R in ohms of the solution is related to the current I in amperes that flows when a potential difference, V volts, is applied between the two electrodes. By Ohm's law, voltage will equal resistance times current. Certain technicalities must be dealt with in practice, such as using an alternating current to minimize the effects of electrolysis, but the essential point is the determination of R, resistance. It's found empirically that the resistance of a sample is proportional to its length, L, and inversely proportional to its cross-sectional area, A. The constant of proportionality is called the resistivity, P, or rho, and we write that resistance equals rho, resistivity, times the length divided by the cross-sectional area. The unit of resistivity are ohm meters. The reciprocal of the resistivity is called the conductivity, kappa, which is expressed in per ohm per meter. Reciprocal ohm appear so widely in electrochemistry that they're given their own name, Siemens. Then conductivities are expressed in Siemens per meter. Once we've determined kappa in practice by calibrating the cell of solution of known conductivity, we find the molar conductivity, which is indicated by a lambda, when the solute molar concentration is C by forming the relationship kappa over molar concentration shown in relationship 9-7. With molar concentration in moles per cubic decimeter, molar conductivity is expressed in Siemens per meter or Siemens per meter. These awkward units are useful in practical application but can be simplified to Siemens meter squared per mole. Specifically, the relation between units is one Siemen per <laughs> mole decimeter cubed. Um, the molar concentrate conductivity of a strong electrolyte, one that's fully dissociated into ions and solutions such as the solution of salt, varies with molar concentration in accord with the empirical law discovered by Frederick Kohlrausch in 1876. In this case, the constant, the limiting molar conductivity, is that the molar conductivity in the limit of such low concentration that the ions no longer interact with one another. That's a very low concentration. The constant, K, takes into account the effect of the interactions when the concentration is non-zero. The fact that the interactions give rise to a square root dependence on the concentration suggests they arise from effects like those responsible for activity coefficients in the debye huckel theory, and in particular, the effect of ionic atmosphere on the mobilities of ions. The fact that the molar conductivities decrease with increasing concentration can be traced to the retarding effect of the ions on the motion of one another. We shall concentrate on the limiting conductivity. When the ions are so far apart that the interactions can be ignored, we can suspect that the molar conductivity is due to the independent migration of cations in one direction and anions in the opposite direction, and write the following, where Lambda plus and lambda minus are the ionic conductivities of the individual cations and anions, some of which are listed in table 9.1 in the upper right corner here. The molar conductivity of a weak electrolyte varies in a more complex way with concentration. This variation reflects the fact that the degree of ionization, or in the case of a weak acid or base, or the degree of deprotonation or protonation, varies with the concentration, with relatively more ions present at low concentrations than at high. Because we can use simple equilibrium table techniques to relate the ion concentrations to the nominal initial concentration, we can use measurements of molar conductivity to determine acidity constants. 
The same kind of measurements can also be used to monitor the progress of reactions in solution, provided that they involve ions. The ability of an ion to conduct electricity depends on its ability to move through solution. When an ion is subjected to an electric field, it accelerates. However, the faster it travels through the solution, the greater the retarding force it experiences from the viscosity of the medium. As a result, it settles down into a limiting velocity called the drift velocity, S, which is proportional to the strength of the applied field. The mobility, U, depends on the radius A of the ion and the viscosity, eta, of solutions, where EZ is the charge on the moving ion. So, let's do a quick example. Determining the acidity constant from the conductivity of a weak acid. So, the molar conductivity of a 0 0.010 molar solution of acetic acid is 0.1, excuse me, 1.65 units, which is the acidity constant, oh, excuse me, what is the acidity constant of the acid? The strategy for this, because acetic acid is weak, it's only partly deprotonated in aqueous solution, and only a fraction of acid molecules present as ions contribute to the conduction. So we need to express molar conductivity in terms of the fraction deprotonated. To do so, we set up an equilibrium table, find the molar concentrations of uh, free acid and conjugate base uh, ions and relate those concentrations to the observed molar con uh, conductivity. So we set up this ice table and we have our initial values set at 0 0.010 for acetic acid and initially, uh, because there hasn't been any opportunity for it to dissociate initially, our acid and conjugate base measurements are zero. And then the changes are all one to one to one. So it's minus X for our reactant and then plus X for our two products. And we can find our equilibrium molar concentrations by the difference between our initial and uh, change magnitudes. So the value of X is then found by substituting these terms into the expression for K sub A. So we'll get x squared over 0 0.010 minus x. And on the assumption that x is small, we can replace 0 0.01 minus x with just 0 0.01 and find that x equals approximately 0 0.010 Ka to the half power, or the square root of 0 0.010 Ka. The fraction alpha of Acetic acid molecules present as ions is therefore x divided by 0 0.010. The molar conductivity of the solution is therefore this fraction multiplied by the molar conductivity of acetic acid calculated on the assumption that deprotonation is complete. We can therefore enter the following, where our molar conductivity is going to be determined by the conductivity measurements of the acid and the conjugate base where we have 34.96 plus 4.09 giving us a total of 39.05 and so it follows that K sub A will equal 0 0.010 alpha squared, where alpha is 0 0.0423 squared. And we can find that the value corresponds to a pKa of 4.75, which is the pKa of acetic acid. So the mobility depends on the radius of an ion and the viscosity eta of solution, where this is a reminder where easy is the charge of the moving ion. And this equation tells us that the mobility of an ion is high if it's highly charged, is small, and if it is in a solution that's with low viscosity. These features appear to contradict the trends in Table 9.2, which lists the mobility of a number of ions. For instance, the mobility of group 1 cations increase down the group despite 
they're increasing radii. The explanation is that the radius is used in equation 911 is the hydrodynamic radius, the effective radius for the migration of ions taking into account the entire object that moves. When an ion migrate, it carries its hydrating water molecules with it, and as a small ion, are more extensively hydrated than large ions because they give rise to a stronger electric field in their vicinity. Ions of smaller radius actually have a larger hydrodynamic radius. Thus, hydrodynamic radius decrease going down group one because of the extent of hydration decreases with the increasing radius. One significant deviation from this trend is the very high mobility of the proton in water. It's believed that this high mobility reflects the entire different mechanism of conduction in which the proton of one water molecule migrates to its neighbor, the proton of that migrates to its neighbor, and so, long, so forth along a chain, shown in figure 9.4. The motion is therefore an effective motion of a proton, not the actual motion of a single proton. This stems from the ability to rapidly form and break hydrogen bonds where you can push a hydrogen onto water, forming hydronium, and then a sequence of hydrogen bonding, breaking and forming and breaking and forming and breaking and forming can be transmitted from water molecule to water molecule quite rapidly, pushing a proton off the other side effectively. So you've migrated protons, but you haven't physically taken a single proton and moved it across solution. And this is actually really important biologically because the motion of proton and other ions across biological membranes is even more complicated and makes use of ion channels and ion pumps to really facilitate this type of effect uh, and rapidly form proton gradients, which is essential for our synthesis of ATP. Now, let's talk a little bit about that, ion channels and pumps in general. Controlled transport of molecules and ions across biological membranes is at the heart of a number of key cellular processes, such as transmission of nerve impulses, the transfer of glucose into red blood cells, and, like I just mentioned, the synthesis of ATP. Here we examine in some detail the various ways in which ions cross the alien environment of the lipid bilayer. Suppose that a membrane provides a barrier that slows down the transfer of molecules of ions into or out of the cell. The thermodynamic tendency to transport a species A through the membrane is partially determined by concentration gradient, or more precisely an activity gradient, across the membrane, which results in a difference of molar Gibbs energy between the inside and outside of the cell. This equation listed, showing the difference in Gibbs energy, implies the transport into the cell of either neutral or charged species is thermodynamically favorable if we set activity coefficients to 1. If A is an ion, there's a second contribution to delta G uh, that is due to the different potential energy of the ions on each side of the bilayer, where the difference in electrostatic potential is listed here. And therefore, the final expression for delta G is as follows, where Z is the ionic charge number and F is Faraday's constant. The equation implies that there's a tendency called passive transport for species to move down concentration and membrane potential gradients. It's also possible to move a species against these gradients, but now the flow must be driven by an extragonic process such as the hydrolysis of ATP. This is called active transport. The transport of ions into or out of cells needs to be mediated because the hydrophobic environment of the membrane is inhospitable to ions. There are two mechanisms for ion transport, mediated by a carrier molecule and transported through a channel former, a protein that creates a hydrophilic pore through which the ion can pass. An example of a channel former is the polypeptide gramacidin A, which increases the membrane permeability to cations such as protons, potassium, and sodium. Ion channels are proteins that affect the movement of specific ions down a membrane potential gradient. They're highly selective, so there's a channel protein for calcium and another for chlorine, and so on. The opening of the gate may be triggered by potential differences between the two sides of the membrane or by the binding of an effector molecule to a specific receptor site on the channel. The patch clamp technique 
can be used to measure the transport of ions across cell membranes. One of the many possible experimental arrangements is shown in the illustration in the top right corner here. With mild suction, a patch of membrane from a whole cell or small section of a broken cell can be attached tightly to the tip of a micropipette filled with an electrolyte solution and contained an electrode, the patch electrode. A potential difference, the clamp, is applied between the patch electrode and an intracellular electrode in contact with the cytosol of the cell. If the membrane is permeable to ions at the applied potential difference, a current flows through the completed circuit. Using sufficiently narrow micropipette tips with diameters of less than one micrometer, ions, ion currents of a few picoamperes have been measured across the section of membranes containing only one ion channel protein. A striking example of the importance of ion channels is the role in the propagation of impulses by neurons. And we actually see patch clamp used predominantly for studying uh, neuron function and transmission of potentiations. The cell membrane of a neuron is more permeable to potassium ions than to either sodium or chloride. The key to the mechanism of action of a nerve cell is its use of sodium and potassium channels to move ions across the membrane, modulating its potential. For example, the concentration of potassium inside an inactive nerve cell is about 20 times that of the outside, whereas the concentration of sodium outside the cell is 10 times that of the inside. The difference in concentration of ions results in a transmembrane potential difference of about negative 62 millivolts, with a negative sign denoting the inside has a lower potential. This potential difference is also called the resisting potential of the cell membrane. The transmembrane potential difference plays a particularly interesting role in the transmission of nerve impulses. Upon receiving an impulse, which is called action potential, a site in the nerve cell membrane becomes transiently permeable to sodium and the transmembrane potential changes. To propagate along a nerve cell, the action potential must change the transmembrane potential by at least 20 millivolts to values that are less than negative, less negative than negative 40 millivolts. Propagation occurs when an action potential in one site of the membrane triggers an action potential in an adjacent site with sites behind the moving action potential returning to their storing potential. Ions such as protons, sodium, potassium, and calcium are often transported actively across membranes by integral proteins called ion pumps. Ion pumps are molecular machines that work by adopting conformations that are permeable to only one ion, but not others, depending on the state of the phosphorylation of the protein. Because protein phosphorylation requires dephosphorylation of ATP, the conformational changes that open and close the pumps is endergonic and requires the use of energy stored during metabolism. And now that we've had a nice little segue, on to everyone's favorite topic from gen chem to electrochemical cells. An electrochemical cell consists of two electronic conductors dipped into an electrolyte, which may be a solution, a liquid, or a solid. The electronic conductor and its surrounding electrolyte is an electrode. The physical structure containing them is called an electrode compartment. The two electrons may share the same compartment. If electrolytes are different, then the two compartments may be joined by a salt bridge, which is an electrolyte solution that completes the electric circuit by permitting ions to move between the compartments. This is shown in figure 9-6. Alternatively, the two solutions may be in direct physical contact, for example, through a porous membrane, and form a liquid junction. A galvanic cell, also called a voltaic cell, is an electrochemical cell that produces electricity as a result of the spontaneous reaction occurring inside it. An electrolytic cell is an electrochemical cell in which a non-spontaneous reaction is driving or driven by an external source of direct current. The commercially available dry cells, mercury cells, nickel cadmium or NiCad batteries, and lithium ion cells used to power electrical equipment are all galvanic cells and produce electricity as a result of the spontaneous chemical reaction between the substances built into them at manufacture. A fuel cell is a galvanic cell in which the reagents such as hydrogen and oxygen or methane and oxygen are supplied continuously from outside. 
fuel cells are used on manned spacecraft are beginning to can be considered for use in automobiles, and gas supply companies hope that one day they may be used as a convenient compact source of electricity in homes, which we'll talk about in box two, uh, nine two. Electric eels and electric catfish are biological versions of fuel cells, in which the fuel is food and the cells are adaptations of muscle cells. Electrolytic cells include the arrangement used to electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen and to obtain aluminum from its oxide in the hall herald process. Electrolysis is the only commercially viable means for the production of fluorine. The electron transfer process that occurs in respiration and photosynthesis can be modeled by electrochemical cells in which electrons are transferred between proteins, which we did in biochemistry too. Looking at standard reduction potential changes as we passed from complex one to complex two to complex, uh, oh, it's not one to two, one and two to three, and then from three to four. Half reactions and electrodes. A redox reaction is the outcome of the loss of electrons and perhaps atoms from one species and their gain by another species. It will be familiar from introductory chemistry that we identify the loss of electrons, oxidation, by noting whether an element has undergone an increase in oxidation number. We identify the gain of electrons, or reduction, by noting whether an element has undergone a decrease in oxidation number. The requirement to break and form covalent bonds in some redox reactions, as in the conversion of PCl3 to PCl5 or from NO2 negative to NO3 negative, is one of the reasons why redox reactions often achieve equilibrium quite slowly, often much more slowly than acid-base proton transfer reactions. Any redox reaction may be expressed as the difference of two reduction half reactions. Two examples are as following where the reduction of copper is shown, the reduction of zinc is shown, both involving two electron transfers, and the difference between them is the sum of copper in its ionic form plus zinc in its metallic form going to copper in its metallic form plus zinc in its ionic form. A half reaction in which atoms transfer accompanies electrons transfer looks like this. where oxygen atoms are lost from MnO4 and form water. In the discussion of redox reactions, the hydrogen ion is commonly denoted simply as proton aqueous rather than treated as hydronium, as proton transfer is less of an issue and the chemical equations are therefore simplified. Half reactions are conceptual. Redox reactions normally proceed by a much more complex mechanism in which electron is never actually free. Electrons in these conceptual reactions are regarded as being in transit and are not ascribed to a state. The oxidized and reduced species in half reactions form a redox couple, noted as ox red. Thus, the redox couples mentioned so far would be copper 2 cation and copper, zinc 2 cation and zinc, etc. In general, we adopt the following notation where a couple is the ox to reduce species and the half reaction equals ox plus the voltage electron goes to the reduced state. A chemical reaction need not be a redox reaction for it to be expressed in terms of reduction half reactions. For example, the expansion of a gas can be expressed as the difference of two reductions. And you can see this in the two following examples where we look at um, proton and hydrogen gas with a gas at a different pressure in each case. And we can also see it below where we look at the dissolution of the sparingly soluble salt silver chloride can be expressed um, as the difference of the following two reduction half reactions here. We saw in chapter 7 
that a natural way to express the composition of a system is in terms of the reaction quotient Q, which is just like K except not at equilibrium. The quotient for half reaction is defined like the quotient for the overall reaction, but with the electrons ignored. Therefore, for the half reaction of NAD plus to NADH couple that we see throughout biology, um, we would write the following, where NAD plus plus proton plus two electrons yields NADH. And Q for this would be the product NADH over the concentration of NAD plus and the concentration of protons. In elementary work, and provided the solution is very dilute, the activities are interpreted as the numeric values of molar concentrations, which is shown in Table 6.2. The replacement of activities by molar concentrations is very hazardous for ionic solutions, as we've seen, so wherever possible, we delay taking that final step. Now, what I recommend is pausing the slide and taking a look at this example where we're expressing a reaction in terms of half reactions. If there's any discomfort around the half reaction process, I recommend working through this and then jumping um, to the next slide in which we will take a little special topic segue. And here we are talking about fuel cells. So a fuel cell operates like a conventional galvanic cell with the exception that the reactants are supplied from outside rather than forming an integral part of the construction. A fundamental and important example of a fuel cell is hydrogen oxygen cell, such as the ones used in the Apollo moon missions. One of the electrolytes used is concentrated aqueous potassium hydroxide maintained at 200 degrees Celsius and 20 to 40 atmospheres. The electrodes may be porous nickel in the form of sheets of compressed powder. The cathode reaction is the reduction of oxygen gas plus two waters plus four electrons yielding four hydroxides with a reduction potential of plus 0.4 volts and the anode reaction is the oxidation of hydrogen gas plus two hydroxides yields two waters plus two electrons and it has a corresponding reduction potential of 0.83 negative 0.83 volts because the overall reaction two hydrogens plus oxygen yield water has a standard potential of positive 1.23 volts is exothermic as well as spontaneous it's less favorable thermodynamically at 200 celsius than at 25 degrees celsius so the cell potential is lower at the higher temperature however the increased pressure compensates for the increased temperature and at 200 degrees celsius and 40 atmospheres the potential for the cell is positive 1.2 volts. A property that determines the efficiency of an electrode is the current density, the electric current flowing through a region of an electrode divided by the area of the region. One advantage of hydrogen oxygen system is the large exchange current density, the magnitude of the equal but opposite current densities when the electrode is at equilibrium of the hydrogen reaction. Unfortunately, the oxygen reaction has an exchange current density of only about 0.1 uh, nanoamps per square centimeter, which limits the current availability of the cell, the current available from the cell. One way around the difficulty here is to use a catalytic surface with a large surface area. One type of highly developed fuel cell has phosphoric acid as the electrolyte and operates with hydrogen and air at about 200 degrees Celsius. The hydrogen is obtained from a reforming reaction of natural gas, where the anode has two hydrogens reacting to form four protons and four electrons, and the cathode has oxygen gas plus four protons plus four electrons yielding water. This fuel cell has shown promise for combined heat and power systems. In such systems, the waste heat is used to heat buildings or do work. Efficiency in these uh, combined heat and power systems, or CHP plants, can reach 80%. The power output of batteries of such cells has reached the order of uh, 10 megawatts. Although hydrogen gas has 
is an attractive fuel, it has disadvantages for mobile applications. It's difficult to store and dangerous to handle. One possibility for portable fuel cells is to store the hydrogen in carbon nanotubes. It's been shown that carbon nanofibers in herringbone patterns can store huge amounts of hydrogen and result in energy densities twice that of gasoline. Cells with molten carbonate electrolytes at 600 degrees Celsius can make use of natural gas directly. Until these materials have been developed, however, one attractive fuel is methanol, which is easy to handle and is rich in hydrogen atoms. One disadvantage of methanol, however, is the phenomenon of electroosmotic drag in which protons moving through the polymer electrolyte membrane separating the anode and cathode carry water and methanol with them into the cathode compartment where the potential is sufficient to oxidize the methanol to CO2, so reducing the efficiency of the cell. Solid ionic conducting oxide cells operate at about 1000 degrees Celsius and can be use hydrocarbons directly as fuel. A biofuel cell is like a conventional fuel cell, but in place of a platinum catalyst, it uses enzymes or even whole organisms. The electricity will be extracted through organic molecules that can support the transfer of electrons. One application will be as a power source for medical implants such as pacemakers, perhaps using glucose present in the bloodstream as fuel. So there's a lot of really interesting applications for fuel cells other than what you may have been exposed to previously, uh, yet there's still technological barriers to their broad implementation. And now that we've talked about fuel cells, on to reactions at electrodes. In an electrochemical cell, the anode is where oxidation takes place and the cathode is where reduction takes place. Repeating that, anode is where oxidation takes place and cathode is where reduction takes place. As the reaction proceeds in a galvanic cell, the electrons released from the anode travel through the external circuit shown in 9-7. They re-enter the cell at the cathode where they bring about reduction. Because negatively charged electrons tend to travel to regions of higher or more positive potential, this flow of current in the external circuit from the anode to the cathode corresponds to the cathode having a higher potential than the anode. In an electrolytic cell, the anode is also the location of oxidation by definition. Now, th though electrons must be withdrawn from the species in the anode compartment, so the anode must be connected to the positive terminal of an external supply. Similarly, electrons must pass from the cathode to the species undergoing reduction, so the cathode must be connected to the negative terminal of a supply. This is shown in figure 9-8. In a gas electrode, figure 9-9, a gas is in equilibrium with a solution of its ions in the presence of an inert metal. The inert metal, which is often platinum, acts as a source or sink of electrons, but takes no other part in the reaction except perhaps acting as a catalyst. One important example is a hydrogen electrode, in which hydrogen is bubbled through an aqueous solution of hydrogen ions, and the redox couple is protons and hydrogen gas. This electrode is denoted platinum solid, hydrogen gas, hydrogen ions or protons. The vertical lines denote junctions between phases. In this electrode, the junctions are between the platinum and the gas, and between the gas and the liquid containing ions. So, a brief example. Write the half reaction and the reaction quotient for the reduction of oxygen to water in an acidic solution. Go ahead and pause here, work through this example, and then go ahead and hit go and return back to lecture. A metal insoluble salt electrode consists of a metal, M, covered by a porous layer of insoluble salt, Mx, and the whole being immersed in a solution containing X ions. The electrode is denoted by the following, where the vertical line denotes a bound uh, boundary across which electron transfer takes place. An example is a silver-silver chloride electrode, for which the reduction half-reaction is as follows. 
the activities of both solids in this case are one. Note that the reaction quotient, and therefore we see later the potential of the electrode, depends on the activity of chloride ions in the electrolyte solution. The term redox electrode is normally reserved for an electrode in which the couple consists of the same element in two non-zero oxidation states, which we see in figure 911 to the right. An example is an electrode in which the couple is iron 3 and iron 2. In general, the equilibrium looks like this, and a redox electrode is denoted where you have the metal, the redox, uh, reductive couple, and then the oxidative couple where M is your inert metal, like platinum, making electrical contact with the solution. Another example of a similar kind is the electrode platinum with NADH, NAD+, and protons used to study the NAD+, NADH couple in biology. So, a quick discussion on varieties of cells. The simplest type of galvanic cell has a single electrolyte common to both electrodes. In some cases, it's necessary to immerse the electrodes in different electrolytes, as in Daniel cell, in which the redox couple of one electrode is copper and the other is zinc. In an electrolyte concentration cell, which would be constructed like the cell in figure 9-6, the electrode compartments are of identical composition except for the concentrations of the electrolytes. In an electrode concentration cell, the electrodes themselves have different concentrations, either because they are gas electrodes operating at different pressures or because they are amalgams, like solutions of mercury, with different concentrations. In a cell with two different electrode solutions in contact as a Daniel cell or an electrolyte uh, concentration cell, the liquid junction potential the diff potential difference across the interface of the two electrolytes contributes to the overall potential difference generated by the cell. The contribution of the liquid junction to the potential can be decreased by joining the electrolyte compartments through a salt bridge consisting of a saturated electrolyte solution, usually potassium chloride, in agar jelly. The reason for the success of the salt bridge is that the mobilities of potassium and chloride ions are very similar and the liquid junction at each end of the bridge are minimized. In the notation for cells, an interface between phases is denoted by a vertical bar. For example, a cell in which the left-hand electrode is a hydrogen electrode and the right-hand electrode is a silver-silver chloride electrode is denoted as follows. A double vertical line denotes an interface for which the junction potential has been eliminated. Thus, a cell in which the left-hand electrode in an arrangement like that of figure 9-6 is zinc in contact with aqueous zinc sulfate and the right-hand electrode is copper in contact with aqueous copper sulfate is denoted as follows. And this is actually a very reasonable place to pause this section of video. I'm going to upload the first lecture here, and then I'll pick this up later and uh, get you guys the rest of the chapter, starting with the cell reaction.